On a future battlefield, seven-ton tracked robots scout the enemy. Divided in three groups, some of these robotic combat vehicle light variants sweep paths through minefields, while others pop smoke to conceal the advance. Meanwhile, the remaining RCV are in charge of jamming enemy transmissions and taking pot shots using anti-tank missiles. Even though enemy counterfire rips through the light robot's unarmored holes, these vehicles still have a computer brain that keeps on transmitting target coordinates to the rest of the force. While precision-guided long-range shells pound the enemy position, the RCV mediums make their advance. These 10-ton mini-tank robots boast machine guns, missiles, and 30mm chain guns. And the third wave follows not far behind. A large platoon of soldiers in M1 Abrams tanks escorted by a herd of cannon-armed 30-ton RCV heavies. This vision is years away from our time, but the Army still keeps on experimenting with the idea of surrogate unmanned vehicles. Contractor Kinetic has already delivered the first of four experimental RCV lights, while Textron has four mediums in the making. Building a prototype for a heavy version is on hold, awaiting the progress on active protection systems, a miniaturized missile defense meant to turn this modestly armed 30-ton vehicle into a 70-ton main battle tank in terms of survivability in battle. The whole robotic combat vehicle family will share a common navigational software and control interfaces already field tested. Each variant will use the same electronic and mechanical standards, a modular open architecture allowing the soldiers on the field plug and play a range of payloads according to their needs, going from missiles to smoke generators and radio jammers. Quoting Major Corey Wallace, a young armored cavalry officer with extensive robotics experience, we understand four soldiers working with red lens flashlight in the middle of the night aren't going to be able to pull a 30 millimeter turret. This same officer is, as we speak, serving on the Army's Future Command's Next Generation Combat Vehicle Cross-Functional Team. Major Wallace said in the same NDIA ARM conference that the goal is for most things to be modular, so the troops in the field can swap payloads in 30 minutes or less. The NGCV team has already drafted seven desired characteristics that are mandatory requirements for the RCV family. Wireless control comes as the number one priority, while autonomy follows in second place. This decision comes as it is because of the Army's wishes of always having a human gunner ultimately deciding whether to fire or not. As for right now, the robots will also need a remote control driver, so each RCV will require two human operators, plus a sergeant coordinating each said pair of robots. But why is this so? Well, while the software proved to be increasingly adept at navigating around obstacles cross-country, well-trained humans are still better at maneuvering under fire from one covered position to another. So the current plan is to let the robots make their own way to the front line, but once there, as they get closer to the enemy, the human pilots will take over by remote control. Based on the field experiment so far, Wallace said that the rule of thumb for the minimum range of control between the robot and the manned vehicle linked to it should be at least half the effective maximum range of the control vehicle's main weapon. This way, the control vehicle will be able to shoot at targets the robot spots, while at the same time keep itself out of danger when the robot stumbles upon minefields and ambushes. The third and fourth characteristics are related to growth and modular design, complying with standards such as the Pentagon Interoperability Profile and Victory 2. This means that instead of having to rewire your own interfaces every time an upgrade is released, you can simply swap in new technologies and specialized payloads from any vendor as they become available. But what's the top priority payload based on digital simulations and soldiers' feedback? Well, Wallace came up with a clear answer. Defense against small drones. As ISIS already mounted hand grenades on drones, and Russia used them to spot targets for artillery in Ukraine, a future adversary is more than likely to flood the zone with swarms of scouts. So the Army looked into drone-killing lasers, according to Wallace, but the power supplies are still a problem to solve as they're too bulky for the lighter RCVs to carry. A far more compact and feasible, he said, is a jammer. This way, the RCV can keep the drone from reporting its position to enemy artillery. That brings us to the next priority, electronic warfare. 
You see, drones aren't the only thing the army wants to jam. Yes, you are very lethal if you blow the turret off a tank, Wallace said, but you are even more lethal if you paralyze the formation's ability to communicate. As Wallace explained, sometimes the best way to hide from enemy sensors is by pumping them with high amounts of electromagnetic distortion. They will know that you're out there, but they won't be able to tell where or how many of you there are. And if radiation-seeking missiles do find the jammer at the end, well, it was unmanned anyways. The third priority payload plays a similar role, smokescreen generation. Just as jamming works to hide the force from radio frequency sensors, the smoke will hide them from visual ones, including infrared. As the fourth priority, we have a multi-purpose death zone detector that will warn the manned troops about any possible CBRN contamination, i.e. chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear threat. In Wallace's words, there's no major war scenario where CBRN detection isn't useful. While building manned vehicles capable of detecting poisonous gases and radiation without endangering their crews is very expensive, a compact, short-range variant can be installed as standard equipment on each RCV to warn human troops following well behind. Now, if something bigger is needed, a long-range detector could be its own full-up mission package. But DARPA has done a great deal of work on smaller sensors to detect such things. The fifth priority contemplates the control of dangerous areas like minefields and other obstacles. For this problem, the Army already has an unmanned minesweeper, the M160 Flail. Experiments have recently been carried out using different specialized robots working together to clear obstacles while keeping the human combat engineers out of range from enemy fire. Wallace also had some other potential mission modules worth considering that range from anti-aircraft weapons like Stinger missiles to retransmission nodes for battlefield communications. Both face a high risk of destruction as they become most priority targets for high-tech enemies. Air defense in particular is the first thing the enemy wants to kill, according to him. But besides all specializations, the Army wants all RCVs to particularly be able to spot targets for the rest of the force, especially for artillery, while having some onboard firepower and protection. The bigger and more expensive the RCV variant, the bigger the weapon package and the heavier the armor to protect it. RCV Light will be designed to fight infantry and unarmored trucks, but will also carry a single anti-tank guided missile to give it one shot against the toughest targets. That could mean anything from 50 caliber machine guns like the 12.7mm M2 to a grenade launcher like the 40mm Mark 19 or even a 30mm M230 chain gun. Even a missile boat variant might carry a whole rack of ATGMs instead, firing on targets laser-designated by other RCVs. We want you all in the industry to innovate, Wallace said during the NDIA conference. Defensively, though, it was better for the RCV light to have its essential sensors, radio uplink, and computer core be proof against a 7.62mm rifle round instead of armor the whole vehicle. This way, they can keep transmitting target data even after the vehicle is totaled. Look at it this way. If it loses its ability to fire a weapon, not a big deal. If it loses its ability to move well, kind of a big deal, but not absolutely a game changer, according to Wallace. But what it can't lose is its ability to sense, so the brain must be protected. RCV medium, by contrast, is a lot more like a tank. It'll carry a pair of anti-tank missiles to counter tanks and high-velocity 30mm autocannon to destroy light-armored vehicles like BMPs. The idea was to use a 50mm gun, but the weight was too much, mostly because weight may also limit secondary weapons. The Army wants a machine gun atop the turret to aim independently and take care of quick high-angle targets like rooftop snipers, but it may be too much for the medium. So how heavy is too heavy? Textron's experimental RCVM is 10 tons, three tons above its lightweight version. While its design is still subject to change, the Army does want to keep the RCVM well under 20 tons, so the medium version will be armored, but not a lot. After thorough study, the Army decided that the RCVM will only be protected to withstand heavy machine gun fire, such as the 12.7mm DSHKS or similar, with optional add on armor against greater threats. The only parts protected at all times must be the brains and the gun turret. Its critical function is to be able to shoot, 
It's not really a big deal breaker if it can't move anymore, Wallace said. The RCV Heavy is the least clearly defined. The goal, according to Wallace, is for it to be a robotic tank with high firepower and survivability similar to the M1 Abrams. The difference, though, would be in the weight, where the RCV H stands at 20 to 30 tons compared to the 60 to 70 tons of the Abrams. But why does the RCV Heavy need to be as survivable as an M1 tank if it won't carry any troops? Well, Wallace says that unlike light and mediums, the heavies aren't meant to operate far ahead of the manned force but alongside it, working as a wingman and enduring the same heat of the battle as the manned tanks. Therefore, protection is mandatory if you don't want a barrage of mid-caliber cannon fire to strip the M1s of their RCVH escort. The RCVH cannot fulfill its fundamental purpose if it cannot maneuver alongside a tank while in contact with a threat, Wallace continued. RCVH must resist as much as the M1A2 V3 because if medium cannon rounds bounce off them and destroy the heavies outright, then the RCVH cannot be considered a decisive lethality wingman as it's intended to be. Now, the task to match the resistance of the 20-ish ton armored vehicle to one of the tank twice the weight is a challenging task already attempted 11 years ago with the future combat system that ultimately ended in failure. But Wallace is well aware of that. A decade later, the Army is urgently putting Israeli-made active protection systems on the M1 Abrams and the 45-ton M2 Bradley. This technology can very well shoot down incoming anti-tank missiles, but can't stop the much faster armor-piercing shots fired from tank cannons. Due to these problems and the inconveniences that programs such as the FCS brought about, are the main reasons why the development of the RCV Heavy is not advancing at the same pace as its lighter versions. We're pumping the brakes with RCV Heavy. We're continuing to experiment with surrogates, test technologies and tactics. But we don't want to go full bore until we understand how to do lethality and survivability, Wallace concluded.